Hi folks, I'm Father Joe Grimaldi. You can call me Joe, and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast. But now, here's our host and friend, Ken Calvert. Hi everybody, I'm Ken Calvert along with Father Joe Grimaldi, and welcome once again to the Father Joe Grimaldi Podcast. The Father Joe Podcast is proudly supported by Hoot McInerney Star Lincoln on 12 Mile Road and Telegraph in Southfield. The all-new 2020 Lincoln Aviator touches down this week at the Los Angeles Auto Show. The luxury SUV that lets you scan the road ahead for uneven pavement and allows you to drive away using your smartphone instead of a key. They got it right. And the 14th edition Wishlist Sales Event is going on now and runs through January 2nd, 2019. You can lease the 2019 Lincoln MKC for only $257 a month and the stunning new 2019 Lincoln Nautilus for only $387 a month. See Star Lincoln for details, Star Lincoln, 12 Mile Road and Telegraph in Southfield. Experience the star treatment. KC along with FJG, um, and welcome to the podcast. Today, today, this is interesting. Well, let me start with this real quick. Sure. My wife and I were we were going out to visit our folks at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. Happened to be on Ten Mile Road, and we said, let's go in and just clean up a little bit and say hi. And so we did. And we were talking on the way back, and she was like, "Do we?" She said, "Did your family have a family Bible?" I said, "You know, I know we did." But it wasn't something that was obvious in the house. Uh, my folks, my dad, my mom, deeply devoted practicing Catholics, but we never read from the Bible, ever. I don't remember it at all. I don't know if it was common at their house or not. Went to St. Google, and I Googled, do Catholics read the Bible? And guess what came up? This is the first thing that came up. It's common for many Protestants to think that Catholics do not read the Bible. They often think that the Catholic Church even discourages reading the Bible. In more extreme cases, some people think that the Church actually tries to hide biblical truths from lay Catholics. Where did that come from, and why? Of course, the Bible is paramount in the Catholic Church. Correct, Father Joe Grimaldi? Oh, you're correct, but the, the statements that you made, there's some basis to them. There is? Yeah. I would say before the 1940s, uh, there was a whole uh, philosophy of thought among the priest that lay people should not read the Bible because this way they would do misinterpretation of the Bible if they read the Bible on their own. The Bible should be interpreted only by those who are able to interpret it. So what happened? Along the ways, uh, there was an establishment of the Biblicum. The Biblicum is a big university in the middle of Rome, Mm -hmm. and it's made up of Catholic priests, Protestant ministers, and Jewish rabbis. And together they do nothing but interpret the Bible together. And so that what they come up with is as accurate as is possible for human beings. Before they can be part of the Biblicum, anybody can study there, but they have to qualify. And how do they qualify? They have to know Greek. They have to know Arabic. And they have to know Latin. Because along the way, the Bible was translated from the Greek to the Arabic to the Arabic to the Greek, and then along that long came Latin, and then you had St. Jerome, who was the one who truly promulgated the uh, the Bible, and eventually the Bible became very important. I mean, in the early centuries, I'm not speaking about just today. But still, people felt that in order to really get the truth from the Bible, you have to know how to interpret what is being said. So, I think it's strange when people say, pick up the book, read one or two verses and then you know what the Bible is speaking about. Well, you have to have a little background (laughs) to know what the words are. Now, for example, we learn along the way that the number 12 and the number 7, these are very important numbers, almost magical numbers. Why? Well, because they point to infinity. 
12 times 12 is 144 mm. times 12 and go on and on and on. Yeah. They point to infinity. The same thing is true of seven. Remember when Peter said, how many times must I forgive my my neighbor? And so he says, seven. And the Lord oh. says to him, no, seven times seven, and so and so forth. Notice that you have the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the 12 apostles and, yeah. and so on. So these are magical numbers that the authors used. For Catholics, we believe that the Bible, the whole Bible, is inspired. Now, what that means is that people who wrote the Bible were inspired to write what they wrote. They did use the literary techniques of the time to get their points across, but by the same token, they were inspired. We believe that they were inspired by God. This doesn't mean, it does not mean that God dictated and people wrote what he dictated. No. It was a matter that we believe that those people who wrote, well, the books of the Bible that we accept, were inspired by God to do so. And then they used literary techniques. For example, we see where the Gospels, the Gospels were not written, they were written eventually by writers, but Jesus spoke those parables so that what he wanted to say came across in an easy way that people could understand. Mm -hmm. Now, it's... Um, the prodigal son, the yeah, mustard seed. all of these things, yeah. yeah. And so he used parables to speak to the people in a language that they truly could understand because they were people, farm people, people that were used to talking about wheat and p people who are used to talk about the earth mm -hmm. and growth and all of that stuff. So today, people are more than encouraged to read the Bible and pray the Bible. And I say pray the Bible because that's important. You can read the Bible from the first page to the last page and not know much about anything, okay? <laughs> yeah. However, if you pray the Bible, I think it will help us all. And what I mean by that, go back to what I said earlier, take a verse in the Bible okay, uh, from Paul, from John, from whomever, and stop and think about what is being said, what you're reading, and then see how it applies to your life or my life individually. And am I doing what that verse is saying? So that's a way of praying the Bible. So you read, you meditate, and you see how it applies to you uh, in the best way you can. Sometimes it's easier to do that than others, but yeah. it can be done. I would think very difficult. Yeah, well, it can well, be done. Well, until you, again, you have to do it over and over again. Yeah, you know, when you, you do it once. You have to keep coming back to yeah, it, not yeah. the same verse, of course. Boy, you know human nature, that's yeah. all I can say, because it's true. What happens is people give up after the first time they try it, but yeah. if they keep trying it, they'll see that they'll finally grasp what, what is happening and that they can read the Bible with, well, with common sense, so that if you pray the Bible, it's supposed to apply to what you live, how you live, and what you do, and how you put into actions the words that Jesus wanted us to carry out. And of course, when you read the Old Testament, again, if you look at Isaiah, particularly during this Advent season, you see where Isaiah speaks to a time when everything will be beautiful. The sun will shine all the time. <laughs> you have the blacks and the whites and the Hispanics and the Chinese and the Asians and so on. We'll all be able to love one another and really bring about peace in the world, justice in the world. There won't be hatred. Uh, there won't be anybody going hungry. Well, it's the whole idea that, yes, we got to hope for all of these things. And then Jesus comes along he was the one that Isaiah speaks about. He says, there will come a Messiah, and this Messiah will be a man of peace and justice. He will see people's hearts. He will not rule just on the way people act. He will see what's in their hearts, and so he will judge them according to what they truly are interiorly. Uh, so 
These are the things that I think are uplifting when we do read the Bible. We look at the Old Testament as a hope to the future when Jesus comes. And then, of course, the New Testament is all about things that happened during Jesus' lifetime Mm -hmm. and how he did what he did and what he said. And so he teaches us. You see, God is invisible. We cannot see God. We don't know God that way. Jesus, who is God, walked the same earth that you and I walk. We have written works to tell us what Jesus said and what he did. And if we could just imitate what he said and what he did, Mm -hmm. we would be well ahead of the game. Absolutely. From what I would assume that the New Testament is easier for some people to interpret and understand and perhaps pray over than the Old Testament. Yes, I agree with you. Because they, they're more familiar with, let us, for the sake of a better word, they know the 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 actors involved. Not actors, but you know what I mean. The, I know what the, you mean, the, the, the actors the, involved. Too. The people involved in it. They know a bit of the story and maybe it's enhanced for them in the New Testament. Here's my question for you, and I don't know if you can answer this. How could anyone decide to start writing the Bible? How did it all start? How did the Bible begin? Who decided to start to create this body of work? You have a very important question there. First of all, let's put it this way. I don't think somebody said, let's write a Bible. That's not the way it works. If you look at the Old Testament, and you look at all of the different authors of the Old Testament, from Genesis, going on to the various books of Ruth and so on and so forth. Those were literary works that certainly showed the plan that God had for human beings to arrive at salvation. So it showed us heroes, it showed us people who uh, people of hope, uh, people of all of these things. And then the New Testament, people felt it important enough to record what Jesus said. Uh. Because don't forget, Jesus was an itinerant preacher, basically. Mm -hmm. And he spoke what was on his mind, trying to achieve it. And of course, with Jesus, we have salvation. So if you look at the books of the Old Testament that lead up to the New Testament, which is the salvation of mankind, well then, you see, people had to record what Jesus said. Now you had four inspired writers who wrote the same story, but in their own way, and, uh-huh. and not each of them, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, wrote around the year 30 or 35 or 40, I don't have the exact, and then John He writes much later. Uh, He writes, uh, the first three would be so close to when Jesus was still around. Sort of ground zero in their case. Yeah. So in any case, so you have these different versions of the same story. Well, the same story follows with the anticipation of Jesus' coming, the birth of Jesus, his suffering, death, and resurrection his ascension into heaven. So you have the whole cycle being covered. You mentioned something to me earlier today that you were surprised how we get to see most of the Bible in the three-year cycle, and this is why the church came up with the three-year cycle. Yeah, it says the Catholics read the Bible at Mass. In fact, did you know that the Catholic Church reads the entire Bible to her congregation over the span of three years. And that gets back to your cycles A, B, and C? Correct. Okay. We're in year, we just began year C, Mm -hmm. because the church year begins on the first Sunday of Advent. And so we finished the day before that first day uh, with year B, but now we start year C. And they feature different gospel writers. For example, you deal a lot with Matthew and Mark and John and and then some of the writers are used more often at Easter time and and you know with the Old Testament we use a lot of Isaiah during the uh, 
Advent season because he's the prophet of hope, if you want. So to answer your question, I don't think anyone said, let's decide to write the Bible. Let's write a book. (laughs) Yeah. So now what happens? As the time marches on, the church decides maybe we should collect all of the books. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, St. Jerome was one of the ones involved. All of the books of the Bible that we accept. So, for example, from the Jewish scriptures, the books that the Jewish people accepted, and of course, the books that we accept, the uh, Catholics, or there is a Catholic Bible. It doesn't differ that much from the St. James, but it's it's a little bit different. Maybe the slant is different. I'm not an expert at this, but I do know something about it, and I just want to mention <laughs> yeah. that you have these different books. They call the canons, okay? Sure. So once the church decided, and I don't remember if it's the 4th century or 5th century, that this is the canon of the Bibles that we will use. Now, there are others that are accepted by the church today because of that university that I spoke to you earlier, the, um, the Biblicum, which studies all of the scriptures in depth and any development in those scriptures, and not just from a Catholic point of view, but from a Jewish and a Protestant and a Catholic point of view. So, the church no longer discourages people from reading the Bible. It encourages people from reading the Bible, but it also encourages people to do a little extra study on it, uh-huh. to do some uh, finding out the uh, how to interpret what we read so that we are not just making stuff up, you know, as magical thoughts. There are a couple of things. It says here the Bible is read during the first part of the Catholic Mass, three readings on Sundays, two readings Monday through Saturday, also known as daily Mass, obviously, at each weekend Mass. And, of course, Catholics also sing the scriptures during the responses. Correct. So that's how it's all tucked into this overall yearly bundle that eventually gets us to the entire Bible. And that was the one one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing was that it says here Catholics are certainly encouraged to, following up on your point, Catholics are certainly encouraged to read the Bible for personal devotion and study outside of Mass. Additionally, there are many excellent Bible studies held at parishes around the world. Correct. And I think that's where you were going with that last remark. Uh And that you can get together, and, and it's more than just a book club getting together. Sure. It's a it's a Catholic book club, if you will, with uh, the emphasis being each and every week on the Bible. And also being led by people who know what they're talking about. Question, final question. Our Jewish friends stop after the Old Testament. Is that correct? Yeah, because in a very simplistic way to answer that, the Jewish people were waiting for a different kind of Messiah. When Jesus appeared... Well, you know, there are many Jews for Jesus as well, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you're familiar with that term. Sure. Uh, but in any case, what happened was Jesus came. He was a wonderful prophet. They loved him that way. But they did not see him as the Messiah. As we speak, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. And what is this Messiah supposed to do? They thought he would be an earthly ruler, someone who would win someone who would bring them out of their tribulations and trials. And yet, Jesus did not come from that. Actually, he came, well, he came into Jerusalem on an ass, okay? (laughs) He came as a humble servant. Right. He came as somebody to serve people, not to become this glorious king. And so, yes, to answer your question, the Jewish people do stop after the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures, but there's a little bit of time lapse Uh between the two. But the responsorial psalm, I want to say something about that, because those are the psalms written by David. Um, Oh. So all of the psalms, we believe that they were written by David, King David. And so they are used at every Mass after the first reading. So, for example, on a weekday, you have the first reading, and a responsorial psalm. Yes. On a Sunday, you have 
the first reading, the responsorial psalm, a second reading, and the gospel. So that's the uh, little bit of a difference, but I just wanted to point out that if you look at the Jewish scriptures, there's a whole book of psalms, and that's David's work. I would suspect as well a lot of people purchase Bibles for Christmas as gifts. Christmas? Yes. For weddings? For baptisms? You're right. I'm applying it because of the fact that we are in that current season of giving. But I also wanted to mention something that you brought up at the beginning. Yeah. I think it's true. A lot of people get these Bibles at baptism when they don't even know they're getting it. And then... (laughs) The baptism Bible is put to the side, or they get it for their marriage. So often, it's like I look at those wedding pictures that people pay thousands of dollars for, and they hardly ever look at them. They just put them aside after they look at them once, maybe put them on the coffee table for a while, look, and then you never see them again. I want to thank you for really kind of taking me deep on this one and I think it turns out to be a powerful car ride that my wife and I took last Sunday. So thank you for answering our questions and I hope we answered most of yours my good friends and uh, until we see you next time I'm Ken Calvert alongside Father Joe Grimaldi and thank you for joining us on the Father Joe Podcast. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. This is Father Joe Grimaldi and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Father Joe Podcast. If you'd like, you can email us. It's F-R-J-O-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. That's F-R-J-O-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook. Simply search Father Joe Grimaldi. And thanks for listening, everyone.